Today we have the Mass. On the actual Sunday, we have the Mass, the Requiem, for Miss Deborah C. And we found out who died. <clears throat> One of our parishioners, uh, very faithful. And they bring her to Mass, drive her to Mass each of these Sundays. And then today discovered that uh, she died a few, a few days ago on uh, June the 28th, and I was not informed as to her death and unable to take care of the funeral and burial. So I'm saying right now, right away at the time of the news, this Mass of the Day of Death and Burial for Mrs. Deborah. I'm going to read here the Gospel and Epistle for this seventh Sunday after Pentecost. And the epistle is taken from St. Paul's letter to the Romans, chapter 6. Brethren, I speak a human thing, because of the infirmity of your flesh. For as you have yielded your members to serve uncleanness and iniquity unto iniquity, <clears throat> so now yield your members to service, to serve justice unto just sanctification. For when you were the servants of sin, you were free men to justice. For if you therefore had you then in those things, of which you are now ashamed. For the end of them is death. But now being made free from sin and become servants unto God, you have your fruit under sanctification. In the end, life everlasting. For the wages of sin is death, but the grace of God is life everlasting in Christ Jesus our Lord. And in the Gospel, take my according to St. Matthew, chapter 7. At that time, Jesus said to his disciples, Beware of false prophets who come to you in the clothing of sheep, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. For by their fruit you shall know them. Do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? Even so, every good tree bringeth forth good fruit, and the evil tree bringeth forth evil fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can an evil tree bring forth good fruit. Every tree that bringeth, forth, bringeth not forth good fruit shall be cut down, and shall be cast into the fire. Wherefore, by their fruits you shall know them. Let every one that saith to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven. But he that doth the will of my Father who is in heaven, he shall enter unto the kingdom of heaven. Those are the words of today's holy God. A few considerations today. On St. Hilary, from St. Hilary the bishop, who was one of the great warriors of the battle against the Arians. And that St. Hilary speaks about, by the fruits you shall know them. And the false prophets have fruits, and the true prophets have fruits. And so a consideration of, by the fruits you shall know them. And today, one of the great tests is, what are the fruits? What are your fruits? If you're truly of God, if you're truly blessed by God, then you will have many followers. Because if you're of God, God will bless you, and people will believe in you, and they will follow you. And so the fruits are the number of followers we have, the number of souls that respond to what we have to say and the good work that we do. That was the fruits. Now, if these are the fruits... The holiest place in the universe would be hell. Because hell has more numbers of people in it than heaven, and has more numbers of people than any other place. And of course, those that are certainly doing the work of God are the rock singers, because they have many fruits, especially the Beatles. They have many fruits. They have many, many, many people that follow them. And also, when the time of Vatican II came, what did they say? We're going to cause the people to come to us, people to love the church more, when we change our preaching and change our ways to the ways of the world and, and make ourselves more like unto the world, what's going to happen? There'll be fruits. We'll see people coming into the church. By the fruits you shall know them. These words are spoken in the Sermon on the Mount. At the end of the Sermon on the Mount, it tells us the gospel, and the people believed in him because he spoke as one having authority and not like the scribes and Pharisees. And early on, we read in the gospel of St. John, chapter 2. 
Our Lord spoke beautiful words. Our Lord performed miracles. Our Lord did wonderful things. And the people believed in him, and the whole of Israel followed him. And it says in the Gospel of St. John, chapter 2, And the people believed in him, but he put not his trust in them, because he knew what was in the heart of man. So if people believing in you was a fruit of priesthood, or people believing in you was a fruit of good work, then our Lord Jesus Christ was not very good at that kind of fruit. Because when the people believed in him, he had no confidence in them. And the people believed in him. They believed in him in Matthew chapter 7, at the end of the Sermon on the Mount. They believed in him in the Gospel of St. John chapter 2. And they followed him as late as Palm Sunday. They were all following him. And Caiaphas was very worried because Caiaphas also believed in the fruits. He said, behold, the whole world is following this man. The whole world's following him. We're losing our people. They're leaving our churches. Very familiar words. Because the modern Caiaphas is saying the same thing. The modern Caiaphas is Pope Francis. And the Caiaphas before him was Pope John Paul II, Pope Benedict, Pope John Paul II. These are the modern wicked priests. And what are they saying? They're leaving the churches. And whenever they go to the church, it's going back maybe to the Latin Mass. But they're leaving our churches. The fruits aren't here. The fruits are, they're leaving our churches. And the fruits are, they're coming to our churches. Now when they came to the church of our Lord Jesus Christ, he was not impressed. They all followed him out in the desert, and they believed in him, and they ate of the food, and they were very filled with all the bread, the, the loaves, and the fishes. But the next day, they were disgusted at his teaching, and they all walked away. And Judas was scandalized, because where are the fruits? This man says he is the Son of God. He says he is the King of Kings. He says he is the Lord of Lords, and every single time the people are ready to make him king, every time they're ready to follow him as Lord, every time they're going to follow him as God, he says something offensive, and he drives them away. This cannot be of God. And Judas was scandalized. This is not the Messiah for me. And his heart turned away from God. And why did it turn away? Because he kept driving people away. He was a scandal. St. Paul would also say later on that Jesus Christ is a scandal. He's a stumbling block for the Jews. The Gentiles, they are shocked at him. He's a stumbling block for the Jews. He is a strange thing to the Gentiles. This man, Jesus Christ, where are his fruits? And when he was 33 years upon this earth, everyone followed him on Palm Sunday. How long did that last? Before the week was out, they had all abandoned him and crucified him and went so far as to say, those same people that said, Hosanna to the son of David, six days later, those exact same people said, let his blood be upon us and upon our children. And when they said, Hosanna to the son of David, they said it without very much conviction. But when they said that his blood be upon us and upon our children, they said it with the fullness of their power and the fullness of their might, and they meant it. The same people. So what are the fruits? Don't count the fruits by the number of sheep. Don't count the fruits by the number of followers and the numbers that believe. So St. Hilary says, there are many false prophets. He is speaking at the time of the Arian crisis. And at that time, there were thousands of bishops, several thousand bishops, and many, many thousands of priests who all believed in the heresy of Arius in all different ways. They were all divided, like in the church today. Some were really conservative and almost like the Catholics. Some were extremely liberal and nothing like the Catholics. And there was a great division amongst them. They all fought amongst themselves. The semi-Arians, they believed Jesus Christ was very, very divine-like. Some believed he was, he was so divine-like that he had no human in him. 
and others believe that he was just an ordinary man. But the Arian heresy is, he's not true God, he's only man. And in the end, they weren't that much different one from another. But they were extreme conservatives and extreme liberals. And the Catholics were driven out of the churches. And St. Athanasius was driven into exile. He was excommunicated three times by Pope Liberius. And he was driven into exile five times. And, the, and, and he was <coughs> constantly <coughs> having to be driven away from the sea. And he came back. This man is a troublemaker. Where are the fruits? St. Hilary was slightly contemporary with St. Augustine and with St. Athanasius. Lived at the same time in the afternoon. Overlapped, their lives overlapped with Hilary's a little bit later. And he fought against the Arians also, taking over the banner that was dropped by St. Athanasius. St. Athanasius died. St. Hilary picked it up. St. Hilary condemned those Arians. And he said, there are false prophets, and these false prophets are going to die. And they're going to go before God. And they're going to say, but we preached in your name, Jesus. We preached in your name. And we did your works. What is the principal work of the priest? It is the holy sacrifice of the Mass. And these Arian priests offered a true Mass. They said the same Latin Tridentine Mass that we say. And then Christ became body and blood and soul and divinity present in that Mass, just like he will in the Mass today. And they didn't even believe in his divinity. But they made Christ present, and they offered the same sacrifice, and they did the works of God. And they raised their hands and said, Ego te absolvo apocatis tuis. They did the works of God. And when they died, they went to hell. And St. Hilary, Hilary says, Well, we did the works of God. We did your works, O God. Did you? Yes, you offered the sacrifice. Yes, you, uh, you, you did the absolution of the confessional. But you are a wolf and not a sheep. And not a shepherd. And why is this? What is it that made them wolves? Some of them are most wicked. You are ravening wolves. Why does a wolf go after a sheep? Consider what makes a wolf a wolf. A wolf goes after a sheep because a sheep will fill his belly. When the wolf is full, he doesn't go after the sheep. He's quite nice to them. But when the wolf is hungry, he goes after the sheep. Now some wolves are vicious and they'll go after the sheep no matter what. Other wolves are nice. And they only go after the sheep when they're hungry. But they are ravening wolves. These are starving wolves. And these starving wolves are looking for breakfast. They are looking for food. And they find the sheep to be their sustenance. So St. Hilary points out, what about these priests, these Aryan priests? And it can now be applied to the conservative priests today. For myself, for instance, I mentioned an earlier sermon today, I'm a Latin Rite priest. I say the Mass in Latin. I don't particularly like the Maronite Rite or the Eastern Rites. There are 23 other rites in the church. But the Pope came to me and said, you're going to say the Maronite Rites tomorrow morning. I'll have to brush up on my Aramaic. Come on. <laughs> and say the Maronite Rites. Because it's the same as my rites. They have a different vestment. They have a different way of making the sign of the cross. They wear a different kind of hat. But they have exact same Mass. And so do all the Eastern churches. They have exactly the same mass. The only difference is the expression and the liturgy. But there's the same Jesus Christ brought on the altar. It's the same sacrifice of Calvary. It's the same body and blood and soul that he brought forth. And it's the same kind of pleasing to God. I'm just of the Roman rite. And I never intend to say the mass and the other rites. But I'm not against the other rites. They are rites also blessed by God. <clears throat> they are rites also that are of the same mess. But consider the situation of the wolves today, and they don't think of themselves as wolves. Consider them. Why is it that a priest who says the Latin Trinity Mass in the Novus Little Parish, a priest of the Institute of Christ the King, a priest of the Fraternity of St. Peter, a priest of the end of, of the various dioceses who says the Latin Mass, and he doesn't like the new Mass. He tells the people, you shouldn't, I refer that you don't go to the new mass. The new mass is not like the old, old mass. It's not as beautiful. It's even got elements that lead to corruption. It's not good. Am I going to tell you the Maronite mass leads to corruption? 
Am I going to tell you that the Eastern rites of the Ukrainians and the Greeks lead to corruption? Am I going to tell you that they're not as holy as the Mass that I celebrate? Absolutely not, because they don't lead to corruption, and they are pleasing to God, and they are holy. They're just a different rite. And I have no right to tell you that the Greek mass is bad, and the, and the Ukrainian mass is bad, and the Armenian mass is bad, and the Maronite mass is bad. No, they are not. They are the mass of God, just like our mass in Latin is the mass of God. However, the new mass is not that way. The new mass is a mass of Satan. The new mass is a mass of Protestantism. It is a mass of Martin Luther. It is a mass of Cramner. And it is a mass that is not a mass. It is a mass that has led to the, uh, to the damnation of millions of souls, and there are all billion Catholics, and hundreds of millions of Catholics have left the faith in the last 50 years. Hundreds of millions, not millions, hundreds of millions. All of our families have members that are not practicing the faith. All of our families have members that have walked away because of that new mass and the, what it expresses. What are the options of the priest? These shepherds, says St. Hilary, they are false shepherds. They're false shepherds. Because these shepherds say, I agree with the Catholics. I'm secretly a Catholic, but I've got to stay in my diocese. I've got to stay in my religious order. Because if I don't, I'll lose my pension. I'll lose my parish. I'll be thrown in the streets. And therefore, I secretly say, the new mass is bad. I secretly say Vatican II is bad. I secretly teach my people against them. But I do not say these things openly. Others say it's just not as good. But it would be a sin for me to say that the wrong, wrong for me to say that the Eastern rites are not as holy as the Western rites. Each one is the right approved by God for the salvation and the true sacrifice of Calvary. But it is not the case of the new. So therefore we have a priest. And the priest says, well, the new Mass is not so good, but the old Mass is. And it's in some priests reach the point that they can never say that new Mass again because they realize how evil it is, but they have to keep quiet because if they don't, they'll be in trouble. These are wolves. What are the fruits? The fruits are this. When our Lord Jesus Christ walked into Jerusalem on the day of the crucifixion, or the week of the crucifixion, it was Monday of Holy Week, the Gospel tells us it was not the season of figs. It wasn't fig season, but it was Jesus Christ hungry season. He walked in and he was hungry and he wanted to eat a fig. And he looked at the tree and he said, I want a fig. And there was no fig upon the tree. And Jesus Christ became angry and he cursed the tree. Because there had better be a fig on a tree when Christ is hungry. And this is the time of the fruit. St. Hilary tells us, St. Augustine, what is the time of fruits? There's a normal time, which is the time of the harvest. And there's the Jesus Christ time, which is the time when he's hungry. Hmm. When is our Lord Jesus Christ hungry? It's on Good Friday, in the middle of the afternoon, when he says, I thirst. He is hungry on the cross. This is the time that he thirsts, and this is the time that he wants fruit. Therefore, what does it mean to have fruits? It means to do good works, says St. Hilary. Those who do good works, this is their fruit. And they bear good works in season and out of season, or rather, in the normal season and in the season of Christ, which is out of season for others. The season of the cross. Are you able to practice charity when you don't have anything to give? Are you able to be able to believe the truth when no one else believes it? Are you able to stand for the rights of God when the rights of God are being assaulted and not being followed? Are you able to give fruit when there is no fruit upon the tree? Our Lord Jesus Christ walked by the tree when it was not the season of figs, but it was the season of his hunger. And therefore, there had better be figs. And so there must be figs upon the tree. 
By the fruits you shall know them, says our Lord Jesus Christ. For men do not gather figs from thorns, grapes from thorns, figs from thistles. We don't gather from those type of things. There must be a tree producing good fruit, and this tree must produce good fruit at all times. Our tree must produce at all times. And the time that Christ comes, and we don't know the time that he is coming, the good tree produces good fruit. Now consider this the test of the tree. When there is a test of the tree, when there is an obstacle given, do we still teach truth? Do we still hold to what's right? Do we still do that which is good? Do we still live by charity? Do we still live by faith? When there is a struggle, when there is a battle, when there is a time of difficulty, do we do that? The good tree bears good fruit, and the bad tree bears bad fruit. Now, what is the bad tree, the fruit of the bad tree? The purpose of the fruit is to be consumed by the wolf. The purpose of the fruit of the good tree is to be consumed by Christ. The tree produces a fruit that is for Christ so that he can come and eat whenever he wishes. Whereas a bad tree produces a fruit which looks just like the good tree very often. Except this fruit is designed for ourselves. This is that the, the, you, are, you are therefore, therefore Lord Jesus Christ says to them, You say that you preach in my name, but you did the works for your own benefit. That is the priest of God who was called by Jesus Christ a hireling. That is, he works with the sheep so that he might eat. That's what wolves do. They work with the sheep that they might eat. And if the sheep don't provide them food, then they don't take care of the sheep. These are the hirelings. But for the wolf, the sheep is the food. He even is worse than the hireling. But both of them act in the end like wolves because they only use the sheep for food. The hireling uses the sheep so that he can make money off the sheep and eat food that way. The wolf uses the sheep so that he can eat the sheep. Whereas the Lord Jesus Christ says about the good shepherd that he loves his sheep, he lays out his life for his sheep, and then he pours himself out for the sheep. What are the fruits? What are the fruits of the, of, of, of our, of, of the, of the gospel? There must be good fruits, and the fruits are to be bring good tree bringing forth good uh, good fruits, the evil tree bringing forth good evil fruits, and every tree that bringing forth good fruit, another one bringing forth good fruits shall be cut down, and shall be cast into the fire. And here it is to be noted, very similar to the Thebes and Lazarus parable. Notice whenever Jesus Christ, our Lord Jesus Christ, speaks of hell, he never talks about mortal sin. Saint Paul does, where he says the fornicators and the unclean are not going to go to heaven. But our Lord Jesus Christ doesn't say that. He says, whoever, he did a parable of Dives and Lazarus. Dives did not give help to Lazarus. Therefore, Dives goes to hell. Our Lord doesn't go down to look for trees that produce cyanide, trees that poison the earth and kill the other trees, trees that murder, trees that rape, trees that pillage, trees that have idolatry. He just simply says, a tree that does not bear good fruit. <clears throat> This tree shall be cut down and cast in the fire. Because our Lord Jesus Christ did not make us just to live. He didn't make us just to stay out of sin. He made us to be, give him glory. To know him, love him, and serve him in this world. That we might be happy with him in the next. He made us to help build his kingdom on earth. To spread his knowledge and love. That's what he made us for. And the priest shall be taken care of. The faithful shall be taken care of. But what is their duty? To work for the spreading of the kingdom of Christ, and to work for the truth and stand for the truth in season and out of season. That's why what's going on right now is one of the supernatural tests of heaven to earth. Are you going to take a vaccine and lose your job? Are you going to stand for Christ? Take the vaccine and keep your job, or refuse the vaccine and lose your job? Are we going to stand for the kingdom of Christ, or are we going to stand for the kingdom of the devil? We're being made to make a choice. I don't know if I'll pass the test. Our Lord, our Lord, St. Hilary says, there are so many prophets that speak in the name of Jesus Christ, but they name false prophecy, and they are reeds shaken by the wind. Why is it that the number
little priest who says the Latin Mass, and the indole priest that says the Latin Mass, will not speak out against the new Mass boldly and violently. Because if he does, he is out of his position and he is in the streets. He is a reed shaken by the wind. Our Lord Jesus Christ said, when you go to St. John the Baptist in the desert, what did you go out to see? A reed shaken by the wind? No, you went out to see a prophet. And I tell you, more than a prophet. The prophet stands, and the prophet preaches, and the prophet commands, the, the, speaks the words of God in season and out of season. But the hireling and the wolf they adjust according to the food. When it is popular and acceptable to preach the word of God, like it was on Palm Sunday, they preach it boldly. <laughs> when it is popular, <coughs> they preach a satanic word, and they're not in favor of it, they will preach it quietly in such a way that they don't jeopardize their position, because after all, they must be prudent. They are like unto Pilate, and these are called wolves by St. Hilary, and they're called wolves by St. Augustine, and by St. Gregory the Great. Why? Because consider Good Friday morning. Herod was wicked, and Annas was wicked, and Caiaphas was wicked, and Pilate was understanding and nice. <laughs> Who caused Jesus Christ to suffer the most? Annas wanted him dead, Caiaphas wanted him dead, and Herod could care less. With all three of those in charge, any one of them, Christ would be dead before noon. There will be no scourging, there will be no crying with thorns, there will be no mockery, there will be no need for a, a trial, there will be no, no embarrassment of being put between two thieves, there will be no shame of being made to choose between him and Barabbas, there will be no mockery of him as calling him king, and calling him the, the man whom we love, and then sending him off to be dead, to death, and washing our hands? Who causes the greatest pain? We will discover when this crisis of the church is concluded that those who have made the crisis go on longer, who have made the crucifixion last longer, are those who tried to play both sides. I've got to survive, and I love Jesus. I've got to survive, and I love God. And so I've got to be careful. I've got to be prudent. I can't speak out against Bishop Vallejo from the SSPX or Father Pagliarani, the new superior. I can't speak out against my local bishop. I can't speak out against Pope Francis. I can't speak out against the evil of the new masters is causing souls to go to hell. My old pastor, Father Hannafin, who died in 2001 at the age of 87, he said the best thing about the new master couldn't be said, the old Irish pastor. It's causing souls to go to hell. Stop saying it. That was his whole theological argument against the race who came to visit Father Hannafin. I saw a hundred of them come and visit him. Should I stop saying the new mass? And that's all they said. It's causing souls to go to hell. Stop saying it. I saw many priests weep. I saw some priests stunned in silence. Other priests looked down. Not one disagreed with him. Not one had an argument against him, the old Irish priest. Because the fact is, they knew. And Father would ask them, so why are you not saying the Latin Mass you used to? Why are you not standing for tradition? Because if I don't, if I do stand for it, I'll be kicked out. If I do stand for it, I will not have a parish. I will not have a home. I will not have a pension. I'm tr and also my poor people, they depend on me. I'm trying to keep them conservative. And all those conservative parishes of the 70s, they all died. <laughs> They didn't remain conservative. They went along with the changes of the church. And the crucifixion of the church lasts longer because of these wolves. Now Pope Francis has tried it again. And this is a great blessing. They say Francis is evil. He's not that bad. He's just honest. And that's not that evil, to be honest. Pope Francis is now saying... No more pure Latin Masses. You indult priests, you're saying Latin Mass only. I want to see you say one new Mass. 
You can't just say Latin Mass only. You can have your Latin Masses as long as you say the New Mass also. And if you don't, you can no longer say the Latin Mass. What? And many priests are afraid. This decree is coming down from Rome. What are we going to do? What's the difference? The pimp is not a pure and holy man. The pimp is a man who never ever touches a prostitute. So he must be pure and holy. The only problem with him is that he arranges prostitutes. He takes a cut from all their sins. He pulls the customers in with the prostitutes. And he makes prostitution possible. That's why he burns in a deeper hell, place in hell than the prostitute. The modern conservative priest is a pimp. The modern conservative priest is one who makes the new mass able to go on longer. He says it's holy mass at nine, but there's a satanic mass at eight. And there's another one at ten. And he has to set up for it. He doesn't like it. He's against it. If you're against it, then be against it. If you're for it, then say it. And all the Pope Francis is saying is, if you say, you say, you, you fraternity St. Peter priest, you were all required in 1999, and right back in the beginning of 88, when you betrayed the Catholic faith, Catholic tradition, Archbishop Lefebvre, right at the beginning of your betrayal, you accepted the new mass, but you said, we don't have to say it. You accepted it. As a husband who drives his wife to an abortion clinic, Pays for the abortion. Is he, is he holy? No, only she's bad. Without men, there's no abortions. So likewise, without the conservative priest, the new mass would have ended long ago. Vatican II would have collapsed long ago. It took the conservative priest to keep it going this long. It took EWTN. It took the conservative priests. And why do they do these things? I'm going to stay as traditional as possible so the people don't leave. That way they'll continue to support the modernist church. They'll slowly receive the poison. And these are wolves. And when they die, they'll go before God and say, But I preach in your name, O Lord. Those works that you preached in my name were done only for your sustenance. So a great blessing has come upon the church. Pope Francis goes through with his present threat. And he says, all the priests who are saying the Latin Mass, who no longer say the New Mass, you're going to be kicked out of the parish, just like they did back in the 70s. You're going to be kicked out of your parish. You're going to be sent to an insane asylum, just like they did in the 60s and 70s. My old Irish pastor went before the Bishop of Louisville, Kentucky. And the Bishop was going to yell at him, but it was an old Irish pastor. So the Bishop was the one that shook in his boots. And so the Bishop said, okay, okay, Father, okay, Father. And he let him walk out. Because he was not afraid of him. I am staying with the truth. I am saying the true Mass. I'm not ever saying that new mass that you're giving us. I'm not going along with the new Vatican II. I'm not going along with that garbage that's been taught to us in the new seminaries. I went to that seminary in St. Myron's in Indiana, and they taught me the love of liturgy. I was just there last week, said Father Hadifan, and they ripped out the altar, and they ripped out the communion rail. And so I visited the, the superior, which Father Hadifan did, and he blasted him. You taught me the love of the Mass, you taught me the love of liturgy, and now you've taken it away, and you are devils. That's what he told them. And they were petrified of the old Irish priest, at that time not so old. Mm. Because they knew he spoke the truth. And some converted, and some came back to the true Mass, and preserved Catholic tradition. But there are so many priests who are going to say both. And that was a wonderful test coming from, from Pope Francis. He can't be accused of anything bad. If you say it's okay to go to the new Mass, and you accept the new Mass, then why not say it? If I'm forced tomorrow to say the Maronite Mass, I'll say it. If I'm forced to learn the Greek Mass, I'll learn it and say it. Because it's holy. But, 
the new mass is not holy. The new mass is evil and is pleasing to God. And I know it, and Father Conservative knows it. And guess what? Father Liberal knows it. And Pope Francis knows it. So therefore, if you accept it, you have no right to say no to it. And they accept it by being in the diocese. They accept it by saying their, their 9 o'clock Latin Mass. They accept it by quietly speaking against it, which is called deception. Who is the one that deceives? He is called Lucifer. God doesn't do that. God doesn't deceive. And when we try to follow the ways of the devil to defeat the devil, it won't work. The priest says to the bishop, yeah, I'm still on your side. And then he says, no, I'm not really on the bishop's side. I'm actually against him. Absolutely not. So we are in a time of, 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 the, of, the, of the, the wolves and the, the shepherds. And there are great wolves in the, in the world today. And the, 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 the wolves are ravening wolves who dress like sheep or dress like shepherds. And they look like sheep. And they seem like friends of the sheep. But they are ravening wolves. And they don't all, they're not all Satanists. They're not all the ones that are leading the way to, to, to the worst part of the church. They are the so-called good ones like Pilate. The so-called good ones who are bringing about the extension of the crucifixion of the church. And because of this move of Pope Francis, there will be a movement of grace where some priests will be able to stand up by the grace of God and say, No, I can't play both sides against the middle. I can no longer say that this new mass is acceptable. It's not. And if they're going to make me say it, I refuse to say it. And not only do I refuse to say it, I will now say openly, it is of the devil. It is of hell. It is not of God. And if you want to throw me out of the diocese, throw me out. God will provide. And there will be priests who will come to God because of Pope Francis. So don't blame him too much. And furthermore, all he's doing is bringing out what's already there. If you approve of abortion, and you approve of contraception, and you approve of all the wickedness going on in the world today, but you don't do it yourself, it's not that much of a difference when you start practicing. So it is now. In any case, we're in a just time of great crisis. We will stand firm to our holy faith during this time, and not fall <coughs> to be <coughs> by the fruit you shall know them. And the fruit of Christ never change. The fruits of the devil do. The rules change. The regulations change. What we're obliged to say changes. These fruits are always changing, but the fruits of Christ never change. And we bear fruit when we're popular, and we bear fruit when we're anti-popular. We bear fruit when, there, when there's a time of the cross, and we bear fruit when there's not the time of the cross. And St. Saint Hilary says, the fruit is not the number of followers you have for Jesus Christ when he did his greatest work upon the greatest tree bearing the greatest fruit, had only one follower. And that was the Blessed Virgin Mary. It was more than enough. We are not to be concerned about the number of followers, but bear fruit. Notice that his sermon on the cross was the same as the sermons he preached the 30 to 3 years of public ministry. The doctrine of the cross is the same as the doctrine of the God of the Old Testament. The doctrine of the cross is the same as the doctrine of the book of Apocalypse and the book of Genesis. It never changed. The divine truth and divine love always the same, including when it's on the cross. And he asks us, are you ready to bear good works? Are you ready to bear fruit even when you're on a cross? This is our great test. We ask the grace of God to be able to bear good fruit when we're on the cross. And then we'll be able to be saved. And who does not bear fruit should be cut down and cast into the fire. Really bless you all. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen.